Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the Governor's Seminar of the 54th Annual Meeting of the Board of Governors of the Asian Development Bank. I'm Zainab Badawi and it's my pleasure to be moderating this particular session. And the session is called Cooperation for a Resilient Future. Now, who could argue with that? That's what we want to do, because as the Asia Pacific region, like the rest of the world, presses that reset button to try to recover from the impact of COVID-19, we do so in the knowledge that regional cooperation and integration is a powerful force for inclusive and sustainable growth. And we all know that the pandemic has been a huge disruptor of travel, tourism, cross-border trade and investment, and it's exposed weaknesses in global supply chains. And of course, it's had the greatest impact on the most vulnerable members of society. It also, however, presents an opportunity for greater global and regional cooperation. And that's what we want to do in this governor's seminar, is to really explore what kind of collective solutions, because we want solutions. We don't want to just talk about the problems. How can we build a new future that is greener, better and smarter, and also one that prepares us better for future shocks? We're going to have some Q&A from you, the delegates, so listen up, please, to what the governors are saying. And there's a Q&A function that you can uh, put your questions on. But first of all, let's have some introductory remarks from our governors to set the scene. And we kick off with Lasha Khudsishvili, who's the governor for Georgia and the current chair of the Board of Governors. Um, your Minister of Finance um, in your native Georgia, and uh, prior to that, you were Deputy Minister and also Director General of the Georgia Revenue Service. So you bring a whole breadth of experience to this question. Now, I mean, I'm stating the obvious, Minister, when I say that the last year has brought an unprecedented economic shock for the whole world. And whilst every country has been affected by the pandemic, some have suffered more than others. So I wonder if you're in your opening remarks, if you could tell us how far you believe that this has led to a paradigm shift in the way that we think of economic development policies. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. The pandemic created tremendous heat to the economic system, jeopardizing macroeconomic stability putting private sector under enormous pressure and threatening very big number of jobs. The economic wounds of the pandemic will prevail beyond the pandemic period. And of course, dealing with the challenges of the post-pandemic period is the main objective of economic policies. Certainly, we all understand how big is transformational power of digital economy. However, during the pandemic period, we had a chance to observe the unutilized potential of it. And we saw that the potential is huge. It will occupy more and more space in the global economic lifestyle. Therefore, it's also a challenge to, for economic policies of the future, how to support and facilitate unleashing this potential. This can also be an opportunity for middle uh, income countries like Georgia to achieve the higher growth by supporting the development of digital ecosystem, which is not easy to, and the answer to the question how is not straightforward, of course. Universal access to high quality internet is very important to boost digital transformation. The government of Georgia started implementation of broadband, broadband project. We call it Login Georgia which will allow almost every village access to high quality internet. Also, we should not forget that the digital transformation goes in line with the human capital development. And here, let me mention the importance of investing in human capital. Another area to focus is that I want to underline is the importance of openness to international economic cooperation. Uh, pandemic showed us how interconnected and how interdependent we naturally are. I think that the future of the global economy is in building bridges and not in creating artificial barriers. Georgia is a country very much open to international trade. 
We have very important, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU. We have FTAs with all our neighbors. We are in FTA discussions with the India, which is going through a very difficult pandemic situation. And I want to extend my words of support to this country. International economic cooperation and openness to international trade, we think that it is right way to go and should be driven for driver for the pandemic economic recovery. I think these are the directions which will allow us to efficiently heal the economic wounds of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister, the current chair of the Board of Governors. Um, for the Asian Development Bank for your opening remarks. You've touched on a lot of issues there, which I'm sure will come up in the course of the discussion and other um, opening remarks, digitalization and, and so on. So um, I'd now like to invite um, one of Asia's veteran politicians and uh, thought leaders, the finance minister of uh, Japan, who is of course the governor for Japan, um, Minister Taro Aso, who has held just about every position imaginable in ministries, um, in Japan, including a state. <laughs> thank, thank you, Dana Zen, Zen nice, nice to see you again. Well, yeah. the EDD has responded. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you because I know that people look all over Asia and Pacific region as saying, we're really suffering now. You know, we need to have some kind of stop. So mm. priorities. So mm. I wonder if you would be able to say what are the key priorities that the Asia Pacific region should be mm. Well, the ADB has responded swiftly to the spread of COVID-19 in Asia and the Pacific region from the very beginning of the pandemic. I highly appreciate the strong leadership of President Massa. We would remain vigilant to the current spread of uh, infection in the region. Therefore, it is essential to further accelerate the development, manufacturing, and distribution of vaccines diagnostic and therapeutics and to ensure, ensure the equitable access for all people. Japan accepts the ADB to continue to providing the strong support in these areas to overcome the crisis. Going forward, we need to achieve the resilient and sustainable recovery while splitting the preparedness for the next pandemic. I would like to highlight the four priority areas. First, we should promote uh, universal health coverage or so-called UHC for all people to have the affordable access to health service for prevention, preparedness, and response to the next pandemic. Second, we need to address the climate change issues, taking into account the situation in the region and enhance the resilience against the natural disasters. Third, quality infrastructure investment is critical to support a sustainable growth with focus on digital and green. Fourth, we should enhance the domestic resources mobilization and ensure the debt transparency and the sustainability in order to support uh, investment for the recovery. Japan will further contribute to the ADB's effort in these four priority areas through a new enhanced JFPL, Japan Fan for Pre uh, Prosperous and Resilient Asia and Pacific. JFPR will also support uh, vulnerable communities hit uh, hardest by the COVID-19 pandemic. Japan expects the ADB to provide a continued and seamless support to the region in order to overcome the pandemic, to enhance the preparedness and the build back better. Thank you so much indeed, uh, Minister. And uh, you highlighted there the kind of short-term priorities, the medium-term and also the long-term vision 
in how um, Asia can recover from pandemic. So thank you very much for your thoughts. And I'll come back to you on UHC, because I know that Japan is playing a very big role um, in trying to roll this out and achieve that. Thank you. Um, so let's go to uh, the governor for India now, Nirmala Sitharaman, the Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs in India. And uh, Minister, just to echo what the governor um, for Georgia said that I'm sure I speak on everybody's behalf who's listening to this governor's seminar in wishing you and your colleagues in your country, men and women, um, all our best uh, wishes and support at this difficult time um, in India with the COVID um, crisis. But I, I want to ask you about something that we often hear discussed, which is people say, look, you can't have a green and resilient recovery from COVID-19. This just isn't feasible, you know, but then others say, no, this is a forced dichotomy. So what role do you think India could play in trying to get a green and resilient recovery from COVID-19? Thank you. Thank you very much, Zainab. Yes, I'm talking at a time which is very difficult. And I thank you particularly and also the other governors for expressing their solidarity with India at this time when we are really facing the second wave in such intensity and virulence um, that I must put on record that the Prime Minister himself is spending uh, 24 by 7 to attend to it, but the challenge is very big. Thank you for the support that the international community is extending to India. And I must place on record the intensity with which our frontline workers, doctors, nurses, paramedics, ambulance drivers, even at the burial grounds and crematorium, the service which is being rendered by unknown, unnamed Indians. And since this is my first address before a set of high level ADB officials and governors, I want to thank every such participant who has helped us, every such stakeholder, every such Indian citizen who is sharing this uh, difficult time with each other. Now I will move over to answering the question that you raised. Cooperation for the resilient future is definitely going to be a lot more driven through digital technologies, through sustainable resources, and through international cooperation, certainly through a lot of give and take between countries. I think what is important, and India constantly reminds itself and plays that role. We have actually uh, faced the challenge of the COVID in 2020, which is unprecedented, with a fast-paced development of vaccine within India. And that is why I think not just the vaccine for the pandemic, for the coronavirus, but also any related medicines, India being a pharmaceutical hub, we had uh, readily and generously uh, extended the help for the global community. And we can see that uh, gesture being uh, with a lot of uh, gratitude being returned as a favor now with all the countries helping us. India also offered uh, the creation of the COVID-19 emergency fund for the SAC nations, and is also leading uh, by example in the global initiatives of the access to COVID-19 tools, ACT, Accelerator, Act A, and COVAX. Now, uh, the post-pandemic future, as I said, will have to be based on principles of openness, transparency, fairness, sustainability, and inclusiveness. And as regards the climate action, global, global climate action, I will uh, say with a sense of responsibility that India is committed to all the Paris um, agreement-based commitments, 
and we are well on our course to fulfill all those commitments. International Solar Alliance is some initiative which we are finding global support for. Other than that, I think digitization, direct benefit transfers for beneficiaries, and making sure that we don't forget those in the lower rung of our society whose health care should be on our top priority. Countries will have to be open about sharing vaccine-based technologies. The TRIPS agreement will have to be looked at in the context of the pandemic. There cannot be any more vaccine nationalism. Countries will have to be flexible about it. Um, I'm sure I will have opportunities to answer questions from you and also the participants. As an opening remark, I would end here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister, for that. Yes, and I'm sure we will return to some of the issues you've raised, in particular that one about vaccine nationalism and the TRIPS uh, agreement. Thank you. Um, let's go now to Carlos Dominguez, who is the governor for the Philippines and your Secretary of Finance in the Department of Finance, but you're a man with more than 40 years experience in leadership at various organizations across so many different sectors, banking, finance, mining, real estate, and, and so on. So I, I wonder if you could just perhaps tell us, you know, from your perspective, what do you think the Asian Development Bank can and should be doing to support the sustainable recovery of its member countries? Thank you. His Excellency Taro Aso, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance and Minister of State for Financial Services of Japan. His Excellency Lasha Kuchisvili, Chair of the Board of Governors of the Asian Development Bank and Minister of Finance of Georgia. Mr. Asakawa, President of the ADB, my fellow ADB governors, good afternoon. The COVID-19 pandemic had a massive global economic impact. Unfortunately, the response to the crisis has been uneven. Developed countries have been able to provide much higher levels of financial support to their people. They've also been able to undertake mass inoculations at a faster pace than developing economies due to their vast financial resources. It is only through the just and equitable distribution of vaccines can the world achieve a safer recovery from the pandemic. The Philippines, therefore, supports the strong call for developed countries, multilateral institutions, and global organizations to join forces in ensuring the accessibility of these life-saving doses to lower-income economies. But our work doesn't end there. The effort to revive our economies will be a long one. Developing countries need access to financial resources to boost healthcare systems and build resiliency against new virus outbreaks. We also need to support the recovery of sectors that were severely affected by the contagion. In addition, we have to rebuild our economies to adjust to the new challenges brought about by the pandemic we have to accelerate the utilization of digital technologies and artificial intelligence. At the same time, we need to substantially increase, in, in, increase investments in renewable and clean energy to address climate change and ensure a sustainable recovery. The Asian Development Bank, as the largest and most experienced development institution in Asia Pacific region, must effectively assist developing economies to bounce back as fast as the developed countries. However, this cannot be achieved if the bank maintains a business as usual approach. As I have suggested long before COVID-19 struck, the Asian Development Bank must continue reinventing itself and realigning its programs to meet new realities and to stay relevant amidst the fast changing landscape. In order to be responsive to critical needs, the Asian Development Bank must level up. Specifically, there is a need for the bank to seriously consider substantial expansion of its loan portfolio in the next five year period. This will effectively support its member countries recovery 
even if this brings forward the need for a capital increase. This crisis is a great opportunity for the Asian Development Bank to continue to demonstrate that it has indeed become a more responsive, agile, and flexible institution as envisioned in its strategy 2030. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Governor for the Philippines there. And um, you, I'm sure President Massa is going to respond to some of those challenges that you've made there, that you want to see the Asian Development Bank be more agile and uh, resilient and you know rapidly responding to the urgent demands of the uh, region. Thank you. Um, let's go now to the alternate governor for the People's Republic of China and Zhou Jiai there, who's the vice finance minister, and you've served in various roles in a variety of ministries and also had a stint at the World Bank, Ms. Zhou. So um, I wonder if you could just give us your perspective on what we are talking about in this um, particular governor's seminar, which is how regional cooperation and policy coordination can support the post-pandemic recovery to ensure that it is more sustainable and inclusive. So, you know, what, how can this actually help? Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Senna, and uh, I'm very glad to see you again. Uh, I'm also very much honored to join my colleagues uh, on this panel. And um, the global economy is in the process of recovery. Uh, however, it is fraught with uncertainty and uh, imbalance, particularly with the recent uh, resurgence of the COVID-19 in some economies uh, in this region. So in this regard, we appreciate very much um, the uh, ADB's role under the leadership uh, of uh, uh, President Asakawa to support the members uh, to tackle with the challenges of the pandemic and to support the economic recovery. Uh, as you made it at the very beginning, the pandemic really uh, changed the paradigm uh, of the, uh, the, the economic governance. And also uh, in order to tackle the challenges, we really need to uh, renew our vision uh, in regional cooperation. I would like to highlight basically uh, four aspects. Uh, number one is uh, enhancing regional cooperation for regional pandemic response. We need multilateral actions more than ever because the impact of the pandemic is really a global public bad. So we welcome uh, ADB's recent adjustment of the APVAX eligibility criteria, and that will enable uh, the developing members to get access to uh, uh, to safe and effective vaccines. And we also encourage ADB to further strengthen cooperation with WHO and COVAX and to respect um, the choices of the purchasing countries uh, on the vaccines uh, so as to uh, broaden the accessibility uh, of the effective and safe vac vaccines in line with the scientific criteria. Um, and um, China is to provide 10 million vaccine doses to COVAX, and we will support ADB and other MDBs to purchase China manufactured vaccines as well. And we also encourage ADB to look into the recent resurgence of pandemic in some regional economies and provide due support. Second, um, deepening the regional integration. We should stick to the open regionalism as our conviction. We are looking forward to the early ratif uh, ratification and coming into force of ASEP as a very strong impetus to the regional integration and the regional trade and investment. And uh, I think ADB should also encourage uh, the joint forces among different regional mechanisms. Uh, for instance, ADB should mobilize more resources 
to support the CARIC and the GMS and help them better align with other initiatives from the uh, members in this region. And also encourage uh, enhanced financial and knowledge cooperation with AIIB and the CARIC Institute so as to uh, further promote regional infrastructure connectivity and, multi, uh, and mutual trade and investment. Number three is fostering green development in this region. Uh, and I think clim climate change is a very serious matter. It is not only an uh, environmental concern, but it is a transformation of the economy. Uh, it may induce uh, the increased cost of the whole economy uh, in many members in this region. So um, ADB should design tailor-made green and low carbon development solutions for developing members with different development stages. Uh, and following the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities will be very necessary. Uh, China will work towards carbon peaking before 2030 and carbon neutrality uh, before 2030 as announced by President, President Xi Jinping. And we also stand ready to work with ADB to implement the strategic pillar of the new CPS in green and low carbon development. Uh, and fourth, uh, enhancing innovative driven development in the region. We need to support members in the region to develop the digital economy and deliver the benefits of technological innovation to, to all. We encourage ADB to build up institutional capacity so as to provide digital era solutions to the members. And ADB itself should also be innovative driven uh, with the effort to explore new policy, new financial products, and new platforms to foster new economy in the member countries. Uh, let me stop here, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms. Zhou. I mean, we hear often um, this mantra that, you know, the pandemic affects all of us and we can only come out of it through cooperation and, uh, you know, that kind of internet at the international level and you're urging the ADB there to link up with organizations such as the WHO and so on, but also you mentioned the GMS, and just to remind everybody, that's the Greater Mekong Sub-Region Health Project, you know, the desire for greater regional disease um, surveillance. So thank you for your um, comments. Let's now go to um, the Netherlands for the alternate governor um, for the Netherlands there, Kitty van der Hayden, your Director General for International Cooperation in the Dutch Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Obviously, we've heard a lot and it's very important about the need to invest in, you know, tr greater trade and infrastructure and, um, you know, renewable energy and, and that kind of thing. But the current pandemic is, is not only a health crisis, it's also a socio-economic one, isn't it? And yes. we must also remain very vigilant about the need to invest in people. So I wonder if you could um, address that thought in your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab, and so much has already been said by those esteemed panelists, so I'm really happy I can focus on, on this element. But before doing so, let me just say that from the Netherlands perspective, I mean, we see the ADB really as a key multilateral development partner in fostering that sort of green, resilient, sustainable, equitable, inclusive growth that all the previous speakers have spoken about. We're not going to get this throughout Asia and the Pacific without the strong role that the ADB is already playing. And I think they have an incredibly important role in addressing the post uh, COVID-19 sort of recovery and relief um, phase. Um, the point you're raising Zainab is really around, it, it's not just an economic impact, it had a major impact on human capital. Let's look at how many children have been put out of school and particularly girls. And many of them will become the lost generation. They will not go back to school, even if COVID, um, if the pandemic is over. Look at uh, child marriages, particularly young girls and how that will affect them. Look at gender-based violence, look at mental health implications. And, you know, the governor of India 
um, refer to the first line health workers. Well, that's mostly women in most countries. Um, unequal access to vaccinations, um, essential services that have also been disrupted. Let's not forget that while we fight this pandemic, many countries have to fund this from their regular national health budget, disrupting essential services such as care for under five children with diarrhea or malaria, um, maternal health care being disrupted, leading to higher maternal mortality and morbidity. So in essence, this really has been um, a socioeconomic and humanitarian crisis with a very distinct, I would say, gender difference. Um, so a couple of remarks on what I would hope the ADB could continue to do as it does it so well. One, of course, is and one of the previous speakers referred to that it must continue with the AppVax. We must have vaccines accessible for all, including for the poor and most vulnerable sections of the community. We have to, taking into account the sustainable development goals, really look at how do we leave no one behind as we start to grow out of the COVID pandemic into a recovery phase? How do we make sure that there's equitable access to education, to health, to social services, to really get those SDGs um, front and center in any recovery strategy? And that must mean a focus on jobs with a particular focus on youth and skilling these young people for the future. And we've said many, I've heard many speakers refer to digitalization. It's not just technological innovation. It also means that we have to skill people for a different future, for different skills that the labor market today and tomorrow will demand. And particularly if we don't want to create even bigger distances between boys and girls, a focus on girls and digital uh, tooling. Um, I also very much want to focus on rebuilding health structures with a focus on essential services, as, as I mentioned. Um, and lastly, in social safety nets. We cannot do this um, if we want to really leave no one behind without investing properly in social safety nets. And that, of course, must be aided by the international donor community. And whichever policy we take, we've been very strongly uh, in favor of having the bank develop a gender policy. This has been a crisis that affected women that were already very far behind, more so than any man or boy. And therefore, if we want to have equitable access to a future of dignity, we must invest in a gender policy. And so I'm really looking forward at how we move um, women and girls out of this crisis, uh, particularly. Thanks, Zaina, back to you. Thank you so much indeed, um, Kitty van der Hayden, for really reminding us, if we needed reminding, that is, that in this pandemic, it is a fact that women and girls have suffered disproportionately, as you say, in so many ways. And we must not ever forget that and um, really put them at the core of any kind of recovery strategy. So thank you for reminding us about that. And uh, President Massa, I know that's very much um, one of the issues that's on your radar. So let me turn now to President Massa, president of the um, Asian Development Bank, of course, and took over at uh, this um, a time of um, extreme emergency when you became president in January last year. You're chair of the ADB's board of directors, of course. Um, so President Massa, you know, we've heard a lot about how regional cooperation and integration is um, necessary. And this is a core component of the ADB's Strategy 2030. And it's in the ADB's DNA, isn't it? But look, during COVID-19, we saw borders closing, disrupting, mm -hmm. you know, national trade, investment, tourism, and all the rest of it. So how can this strategy still remain relevant in the face of this? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Zainab. Uh, for this very important uh, question. But before I respond to you, can I just uh, immediately, uh, quickly uh, respond to uh, two points raised by uh, governors so far. One is about the vaccination, and the, another point is about ADB's operation from now on. Uh, as to the uh, vaccination, as uh, uh, Minister Stalman san and Jai and uh, uh, Alternative Governor Bandu Hiden san, uh, they're all pointing out uh, the importance of vaccination uh, in our region. That's true. So, in order to uh, uh, respond to uh, you know such requests from our DM 
uh, seats, uh, developed member, member countries of ADB, uh, we have introduced a new financing instrument uh, called EpiVax, Asia Pacific uh, Vaccine Access Facility, uh, last December uh, to uh, provide financing for DMCs uh, to uh, procure uh, safe and effective vaccines, as well as uh, to provide financing for necessary investment uh, to uh, introduce uh, effective and uh, equitable uh, vaccine uh, distribution system like uh, uh, super cold chain uh, storage and the necessary transportation and so on. And uh, so far, we already approved you know, our four projects under AP Bax, uh, one for Indonesia, one for Philippines, one for Afghanistan, and one for uh, Pacific countries. Uh, so, uh, and also uh, in currently we are, we are working on many other uh, uh, countries uh, who have uh, tapped this uh, new financing. But one thing which has proved to, to be is that, you know, even after securing necessary finance, financing for uh, DMCs to pro procure a vaccine is done, still, you know, it's not really easy uh, for our DMCs to actually uh, purchase uh, their uh, uh, vaccines in a timely manner in the market because of the huge gap between uh, demand and supply. Supply is so limited, uh, you know, whereas uh, demand is gigantic. Uh, so in order to mitigate this uh, huge, you know, demand and supply gap, I have now a strong feeling uh, that we need to start to invest more and more uh, in other uh, vaccine manufacturer uh, companies in our region, right? Like uh, ones in uh, India, as uh, Minister Starman as, uh, mentioned, uh, in order to uh, enhance, uh, expand uh, the vaccine uh, production capacity. Uh, that's another thing we should really, you know, seriously consider. Uh, about the ADB uh, possible, you know, uh, portfolio from now on, a lending volume from now on, appointed uh, by uh, Secretary Dominguez. Yes, uh, actually, uh, last year of 2020, under this enormous uh, working uh, circumstances, our uh, disbursement as uh, commitment amount uh, was recalled high at around 32 uh, billion uh, US dollars, which is almost 150% larger than uh, the previous year of uh, 2019, bucked by the again recalled high uh, borrowing amount from our capital market by ADB uh, with uh, around 36 billion dollars. So I really appreciate uh, the modern technology uh, that made this happen, and also uh, the uh, staff uh, who really worked very hard, uh, you know, around the clock, or the, around the clock, uh, not only in Manila, but they are all over the world. Uh, so despite the time difference, uh, you know, they really, you know, uh, contributed a lot uh, to this, uh, you know, extraordinary performance of ADB's uh, lending and borrowing operation last year. From now on, uh, you know, uh, 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 before that, I, I also would like to remind you uh, that uh, around, uh, you know, among this uh, 32 uh, billion uh, commitment amount, 50%, almost 50% was uh, for uh, any uh, economic measures to fight against uh, this pandemic. And the remaining 50% was for, you know, kind of long-term uh, development uh, purposes like uh, uh, climate change, uh, quality infrastructure, and uh, gender issues, uh, you know, poverty alleviation, and, and, and so on. Uh, from now on, uh, you know, assuming uh, that we will not see any more uh, significant uh, outbreaks, I'd like, uh, you know, uh, try to achieve a little bit more balanced uh, portfolio uh, uh, between our uh, necessary uh, 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 lending uh, to fight against for DMCs to fight against COVID-19 and our lending operation uh, for uh, a more long-term, uh, medium to long-term development uh, goals. Having said that, uh, uh, in order to res uh, respond to uh, Zenav's uh, point about the regional cooperation and its relevance, yes, I, I do believe it's very much relevant. Uh, to fight against COVID-19, but also to achieve uh, various goals in SDGs. Uh, although economic recovery began from the uh, latter half of 2020, uh, prospects diverge. Uh, some economies in the region are returning to normal and are seeing growth boosted by exports, uh, while others are still contending uh, with domestic outbreaks and dampened tourism. It looks like, you know, well, 
rejuvenation, you know, uh, return of tourism uh, looks very slow. Developing countries in, in Asia and the Pacific will need to work more closely together to overcome this crisis and ensure a resilient, inclusive, and green recovery, as everybody uh, mentioned. Uh, there are three priorities in this regard. So uh, let me highlight three, three areas. The first is to reinvigorate trade and investment and deepen regional supply chain, as uh, our governor of Georgia uh, emphasized. Uh, the region's remarkable growth over the past decades was driven in large part by strong international trade and foreign direct investment, uh, as everybody knows. While the pandemic has brought severe disruptions to global trade and investment so far, we already see strong rebound of net exports, especially those of manufacturing products for people <coughs> from Republic of China, PRC, Republic of Korea, Singapore, and Taipei, China. As such, I do believe globalization, globalization will eventually return, although I also believe it will take a slightly different shape. To see, but anyhow, to seize the opportunity of reviving international trade and new development, the region should renew its commitment uh, to regional cooperation and integration by deepening regional trade and supply chains. Recent mega trade deals are excellent examples. The March 2018 signing of the 11 member comprehensive and Pro progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, and the November 2020 signing of the 15-member regional uh, comprehensive economic partnership, RCEP, and the scored our region's strong commitment to open trade and investment. Building on this momentum, we need to further improve regional connectivity infrastructure and trade logistics, reduce trade costs, address behind the border bottlenecks, such as non-tariff barriers and restrictive regulations, and promote paper trade. ADB will continue to support these efforts through our regional infrastructure projects and technical assistance solutions for customs procedures. We have been also working together with commercial banks to support supply chain networks, provide trade finance, and address working capital shortages, particularly for small and medium enterprises hit hard during the pandemic. Since April last year, we have provided $6.5 billion to support trade and supply chain finance transactions, including co-financing from partner banks. Second, we do need to reinforce regional financial safety nets. In some advanced economies, rapid vaccine rollouts have brightened their recovery outlook, uh, raising the spec specter of inf inflation and monetary policy normalization. A return to normal interest rate levels, in particular in the US, could trigger another taper tantrum, which we saw uh, in the year to, uh, 2013, among Asia's emerging markets with heightened currency and financial volatility, I, as we saw a couple of times in their history. So this region needs to enhance regional financial safety nets to cushion possible spillovers from global shocks. ASAM plus three chain my initiative multilateralization or CMIM is a very good example. Recently, ASAM plus three economies have made significant improvements in the CMIM's operational flexibility and readiness by increasing the IMF delinked portion from 30% to 40%. Adopting an information sharing mechanism between the CMIM and the IMF and conducting test plans to better understand various operational risks and further enhance CMIM's operational readiness. It is also important to develop, nurture, and deepen local currency bond markets to help alleviate currency and maturity mismatches, further mobilize a local investor base, and make financial markets more resilient. In spite of the pandemic, by the end of 2020, emerging East Asia's local currency bond market has reached $20.1 trillion, 18% higher than a year earlier. ADB has always been supportive of the CMIM and the development of local currency bond markets in the region. And thirdly, we need to enhance regional health security. Even as countries worldwide are still grappling with COVID-19, we must think 
how we can prevent future global pandemics. Regional cooperation and integration can play a critical role in improving communicable disease control, disease surveillance, and outbreak response systems, and information sharing. For example, in the Greater Mekong Subregion Program, which uh, Jai I mentioned, pointed out, ADB supported implementation of a regional communicable disease control project even before the outbreak, COVID-19 outbreak, uh, which helped uh, contain outbreaks of disease, reduced fatalities, and strengthened regional networks. Uh, stronger regional disease surveillance systems that share epidemiological data between countries, strengthen border quarantine systems, and share knowledge about their COVID-19 response will help us better place uh, for the next epidemic and pandemic in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, uh, President uh, Massa, for and also responding to what some of the governors uh, raised. And uh, you mentioned the CCMI and maintaining momentum in financial cooperation is very important. And um, of course, we know that uh, you know the Asian regional integration in finance has lagged a bit behind Asia's um, integration in trade, and there's clearly more that could be done there. So um, thank you for your opening remarks. I'm getting lots of questions in and delegates, please keep on um, sending your questions and I'll try and um, include as many as I can. Um, but President Massa, you and others have uh, mentioned this issue of um, increasing Asia Pacific's region's vaccine production capacity. It's not just a question you mentioned, the sharing of knowledge in health matters is very important, but this issue of production capacity is critical. So let me come to um, the governor for India, because of course your country is the world's biggest um, production manufacturer of uh, vaccines. So let me put this question to you that's come from our delegates, and it is, it's imperative to invest in vaccine manufacturers in the region to boost available vaccine supply to get beyond the pandemic. What steps can countries take to improve vaccine supply and how can the ADB help? So what would you say to that question, which has had a lot of interest from our delegates? That's right. Um, there has to be a great degree of focus in uh, ramping up the capacities for producing vaccines, not just improving, not just scaling up, but also um, making sure that for countries, for both domestic and for export purposes, for which at the moment, India is committed uh, to support not just the two vaccine candidates, not any longer candidates, productions which are happening, both Covishield and India's own Covaxin are developed and ramped up uh, the scale of production so that we use it because you know, in the third phase in India, the first phase we covered all the frontline workers, the second we brought down the age group to 45 and everybody else above 45. Now from 1st May, we have said 18 years and above everyone will have vaccine provided. And in government hospitals, both at the federal level and the state level, regional, provincial level, they are being provided for free for citizens. In, only in some private hospitals has the government allowed vaccination on some payment. And even at that, uh, even that has been kept at a very affordable level so that there is no inequity in distributing. But even for us, with two vaccination available within the country, vaccines available within the country, there is a need for us to have greater investment. One critical point in ramping up the production capacity is access to critical raw materials. Now, sometimes, although we speak about global value chains and the need for countries to open up trade to, and also facilitate uh, free movement of raw materials, critical components, critical APIs, and so on, we find that the movement of critical raw materials for production of vaccines is finding certain hiccups. We would love that to be sorted out at the earliest so that India can produce. And India actually has already pre-COVID, not just for COVID, but even before COVID, 
has been the center for producing more than 60% of vaccines required for all other uh, diseases for the entire world. And we'd love to perform on the COVID vaccine production as well, because now we have two of them. There are th two more uh, coming up. One particularly is going to be easy for the entire world to handle because that's a nasal vaccine. So for all this, I would think it's important that the critical raw materials be available and made to flow freely. And second, also that the COVID tools, whether they are diagnostic, therapeutic, vaccines, uh, uh, everything related to COVID should be flexible. There should be some kind of a global platform which can share these uh, information because COVID is not now confined to any geographical area. It is across the globe. We need to have a global multilateral approach to all this. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister. Does, uh, do any of the other governors want to come in on this particular question we've had? Um, you know, we've heard raise their access to raw materials and also the sharing of information. Does any, anybody else want to answer this particular point on how you can increase vaccination production capacity in the Asia region? Okay, well, let's go. Nobody else. All right. Let's go to another question. Um, Minister Tara Asso, I'm, I'm going to give this one to you because I know that you touched on it briefly in your opening remarks. And it's this question, which has also had a lot of support um, on the Q&A function. The pandemic has put healthcare in the spotlight and Japan is leading a discussion to promote universal healthcare, UHC. What challenges must the Asia Pacific region overcome to achieve UHC and what kind of role do you expect the ADB should take? So I wonder if you would answer that one, Minister Taro Asso. Mm. Mm. For many years, Japan has called for the importance of enhancing the preparedness and response, um, pandemic, I mean pandemic preparedness and response and has worked on promoting UHC, universal health coverage. The COVID-19 pandemic has reconfirmed that building a resilient health system plays an important role, not only for the improvement of the human health, but also for the sustainable economic growth. Asia and the Pacific region is a potential hotspot of the infectious diseases. In addition to the traditional health challenges such as the infectious disease and the maternal and the child health, the region also faces other health challenges, including aging and the non-communicable disease. The following three areas are especially important to achieve the UHC. First, institutional framework, including the medical insurance. Second, human resources development. Third, infrastructure investment to support health system. Japan supports the ADB's effort to achieve the UHC by providing the 15 million US dollar to the Japan Trust Fund in the, in the AD, ADB. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister. Let me just go quickly to President Massa on that because the question is also about what the ADB can do. We've heard Minister Tara Asa there talk about, you know, the um, importance of investing in infrastructure, human resources, and also building institutional capacity, insurance, that kind of thing. So how can the ADB help around that framework? Yes, uh, thank you, zainab -san. You know, I really appreciate Japanese contribution to ADB uh, to advocate this UHC. I, I know that even before this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, broke, uh, Japan has been really advocating the importance of UHC uh, for years. Uh, but this pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, has even highlighted as a significant weakness uh, in, the, in this region's healthcare system. Uh, the low share of government spending and the lack of significant uh, insurance coverage means 
the share of out of pocket or, or, or copayment uh, payment uh, by individuals remains still very high. And uh, therefore, uh, the risks uh, are pushing people into poverty uh, when a, cri a health crisis like this uh, strikes are very high. Uh, the answer is really UHC, universal health coverage, uh, where all people have access to the health service uh, when and where they need without any financial hardship. And uh, in the context of development strategy, I really think you know, uh, developing member countries uh, had better to introduce uh, UHC at, uh, at relatively early stage of their uh, development uh, process. I, I remember uh, Japan introduced UHC as early as 1966, uh, very early. And also it's very important uh, for the MCs uh, uh, not to much rely on external financing uh, in introducing UHC. Uh, but, but by utilizing uh, its own uh, domestic resources to make uh, the whole UHC system in that country uh, financially viable. Uh, that's why uh, you know, it's very important uh, to involve uh, finance ministers, uh, not only you know, leave everything to health ministers, but involve finance ministers uh, from the day one uh, of uh, the uh, planning of this uh, UHC and ADB, uh, uh, you know, utilizing the you know very various uh, uh, variable contribution from Japan and so on, very much would like to support uh, the uh, DMC's effort uh, to introduce and also sophisticate uh, its own DMC system. Thank you very much indeed, making that a very clear point that UHC, of course, is critical. But you say there quite clearly, President Massa, that in your opinion, one shouldn't rely on external finance to bring that about, but on domestic resource mobilization, in particular tax, because I know that the tax to GDP ratio in the region could be um, greatly improved. Thank you. We've got a question here, which I'm going to give to you, Kitty van der Hayden, because it mentions your country in particular. How can bilateral donors like the Netherlands and multilaterals like the ADB involve NGOs in supporting a resilient future in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you. Um, look, this, this question is incredibly important because if you are really thinking from a leave no one behind perspective, I do not think the public sector alone can do this. So from our perspective, the Netherlands has always been a very strong partner of civil society that has uh, its, its roots, I would say, everywhere in the country, including in the most disadvantaged areas that help particularly women and girls to um, achieve the rights that they have been given under the SDGs. So we're incredibly supportive of the role of NGOs alongside the public sector, and by the way, also alongside the private sector. Um, and I think this is a well-established principle in the development cooperation programs that the ADB has as well. To do this and to do this well with the speed required, we're going to have to bring in everyone, NGOs, the science communities, the public sector and the private sector. So very strongly supportive of this. And I know they have a voice in the ADB as well. Thank you very much indeed. Well, that, that relates to another question we had on this, uh, which is that... Uh, CSOs, um, civil society organizations, are asserting that the path to recovery must not be profit driven. So the question is, how can the ADB and government ministers assure that their support prioritizes people rather than corporates? And that's something that you touched on in your remarks, uh, uh, Kitty van der Hayden. But I wonder if somebody else could um, address that. I don't know, Carlos Dominguez, you, you want to perhaps pick up on how we can ensure uh, that uh, support prioritizes people rather than corporates? Well, first of all, uh, I have uh, made a statement earlier that the, uh, that the ASEAN and uh, the ADB should establish some kind of uh, uh, ability to produce vaccines for the region. Now, I don't foresee this to be a totally private, uh, totally uh, government uh, driven enterprise. I believe it must be a partnership with the private sector. Uh, private sector brings in uh, efficiency and uh, frankly, in my experience as a government uh, minister, 
uh, efficiency is not number one in uh, our uh, our uh, DNA. Okay, it's so uh, I think a partnership with uh, both, where the goals and the uh, the profit, uh, the the return on investment are very very clearly defined. Uh, I, I, I strongly believe that uh, prof, uh, the private sector should be involved uh, and so must government uh, to, how would you say, uh, to moderate uh, corporate greed, but their methods are so important. So uh, I think a, a PPP or a private, uh, uh, private public partnership is called for in this area. Uh, for example, I know that in India, the uh, the large manufacturers are totally private, uh, and uh, they do cooperate uh, with the regulator, uh, not only for safety, but I believe also uh, to have a how would you say a social conscience. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. I wonder if anybody else wants to come in on that particular point. Yes, President. Matt uh, President, okay. and then I'll go yeah. to China. Oh, should I go to China first, President? Yeah. Yes, Ms. Zhou, I think, had her hand up. Uh, just what uh, just want to say uh, uh, a few um, supplemental words on this, uh, um, how to make the uh, corporate sector to be uh, uh, people-centered instead of uh, profit maximization. Um, see, uh, China is pursuing a people-centered uh, modality of development. So I think I, uh, uh, I would agree with the uh, Filipino uh, minister that the partnership between the uh, government and the private sector is very, very important. There are many ways to encourage the corporate sector to uh, fulfill uh, social responsibilities. Uh, take an example, uh, uh, what happened in China at the beginning of tackling the pandemic, I think the Ministry of Finance first at, at the first time to make the budget uh, um, resources available to support the whole society to fight against the virus and also provide help the financial institutions to provide concessional financing to those enterprises to produce the, uh, the product of uh, the pandemic, pandemic control. So uh, we mobilize SOEs as well as private companies uh, to produce the, um, uh, the, uh, the products of the pandemic control, which is in urgent need, not for the purpose of profit maximization, but to meet the urgent demand. Of course, we are not going to uh, make economic losses to those companies because uh, anyway companies are still the main forces of the uh, market economy so we need to protect their interests but at the same time to give them guidance to fulfill their due social responsibilities and we also developed uh, performance indicators to those uh, uh, SOEs and state-owned financial institutions and to examine uh, their effectiveness to fulfill the uh, social responsibility uh, in their operations while still keep the, uh, keep the business profitable. So, so I think it's really uh, need to strike balance and the partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. O. Such an important point to make there. Uh, um, governor for India, so you've got to strike the balance. Yes, let them maintain their financial interests, but also they've got to not lose sight of their social responsibilities. Your, your comments on this question? Yes, this is a very important uh, point to discuss at this uh, stage. And in India, we've taken quite a few steps and uh, uh, rightly the governor from Philippines uh, highlighted the fact that Indian vaccine developers, um, particularly those in private sector, uh, essentially today for COVID, they are both in private sector, have definitely worked together with the government and kept their profit considerations aside and given it at an affordable price for government to distribute it freely for all citizens. Uh, over and above that, they have also now been allowed to 
uh, sell a portion of their uh, vaccines in the private area as much as they would want for any buyer so that their uh, you know, risk capital that they have invested is also honored and respected. But they are definitely cooperating. Other than that, I must say that Indian corporate sector has been given under the corporate social responsibility uh, fiscal uh, benefits that are uh, given to them on the basis of the 2% profit that they would spend for social causes. They have been allowed to establish uh, temporary um, ad hoc hospitals for dealing with patients who require care for the COVID pandemic. And these are temporary hospitals with all kind of intensive care uh, facilities, whether it is ventilator, good professional doctors, and also taking care of oxygen supply and good medicines too. So corporate sectors participating in a big way in many cities, undertaking this responsibility of establishing hospitals for the COVID pandemic. And even further, government itself has allowed, because Indian economy depends on, uh, le, uh, yes, uh, uh, the medium, small, and um, micro industries, MSMEs as we call them, are the backbone of Indian economy. They probably don't make as much profit as a large would do. But for them to, what we have done is during the emergency, COVID emergency, because uh, there was a lockdown, many of them didn't know how to raise additional finances to keep their employees on board, although there was no work going on. Uh, and many of them had to refresh when the unlocking happened. Now the second wave is on, but I'm talking about the 2020 experience. We gave them a government guaranteed special assistance through which they could be given bank loans so that they can keep their business sustained for the unlock to happen. We've extended some of that even now during the second lock-in. Um, so uh, long and short of it is the corporate sector should also be doing it. In India, they're doing, uh, participating in the social synergy which is required to handle this pandemic. Thank you so much indeed. Clear example there of what can be done at a national level, providing assistance, incentives and so on. Uh, President Massa, your um, brief response on this question, because I've got many more to ask. <laughs> All right. Well, as uh, Jai uh, rightly mentioned, you know, pro profitability alone uh, cannot be uh, you know, a sole purpose of de development policy, of course. But it's also you know, very much true uh, and important uh, to involve uh, private financing in uh, many, many aspects of our development uh, policy orientation, like uh, high quality infrastructure, which uh, uh, you know, Minister also emphasized. Uh, there's a huge gap uh, between demand and supply in uh, infrastructure financing. And it's so obvious that public money or financing from uh, you know, international uh, financial institutions alone would not uh, uh, satisfy uh, those huge, huge appetite. So we definitely need to catalyze uh, our, our private sector financing to fill the gap. And also it's true uh, for climate financing. We have a, a clear you know, uh, purpose, uh, target of $100 billion uh, uh, transfer uh, to uh, developing countries in, in the context of uh, climate financing. So definitely we need climate financing here. And the vaccine production, which we have been uh, you know, discussing today, you really need uh, the involvement of, of private sector. So uh, I think that there should be a, a really appropriate incentive and scheme uh, as appropriate. It's very much necessary uh, in our uh, development policy orientation here and there. And also let me add one more thing about uh, CSO, civil society's role. Uh, CSOs have unique uh, strengths, uh, which can be uh, very valuable for ADB. Uh, to enhance its development effectiveness uh, for uh, two levels. Uh, one is at the project level, uh, each project level, uh, participation of grassroots uh, CSOs in the design and implementation of our projects helps us uh, to target poor and vulnerable groups and monitor project impacts. That's one thing. And secondly, as a policy level, a higher level of policy, uh, national and international advocacy CSOs are in very important partners who can provide insightful uh, suggestions during the review and update of our operational policies. Uh, currently, uh, ADBs is consulting with CSOs in the ongoing review of two major policies, energy policy and safeguard policies. 
uh, CSO's engagement is a continuous uh, process which uh, goes on year round in this regard. So I'm very pleased to see a uh, key interest and engagement from CSOs in ADB's uh, work. That's great. Thank you very much indeed for emphasizing all that. Let me go to uh, Georgia because we haven't heard from you in this Q&A uh, session. And, and I'll give you this open question, which um, we've received national uh, Billy. Um, fight the pandemic while preparing for the next. What are the early lessons learned? Nice big open question for you there. Thank you. So first of all, I, I would like to few words uh, say about the access to, to the vaccines. So uh, uh, actually for the developing countries like Georgia, so accessibility uh, to the vaccines is, is very critical, like, like in most countries worldwide. So at the moment, we talked about that uh, the uh, economic side of the uh, uh, vaccination process is, is very important. But actually, the, uh, the process uh, of the pandemic goes in that way that the answers from the international financial organizations uh, in response to, to the challenges from the financial side well, was really huge. And I can name the ADB, which, uh, which made the unprecedented uh, huge finances in uh, support to the developing countries. And I would like to thank you for, for that. So, uh, of course, the, uh, I agree with the governor from the Philippines that uh, the efficiency in the private sector is, is really huge. Uh, and we, we see that at the moment, uh, the economic side of the accessibility to the vaccines is less problematic, uh, at least from our point of view, than the production side. So uh, the the heat was uh, heat which was received by by the uh, by the pandemic and the price we are paying for 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 this crisis is uh, un. Com, uh, we, we just cannot compare with, 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 with the with the uh, financial aspects of uh, the vaccination, and this is not not only the uh, from the economic perspective uh, price we, we are paying for it. So we are paying with the life. So uh, the, this is very important that uh, to 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 have more attention to to the production side to increase the pro, pro production of, of the vaccines. Then uh, to to the economic uh, side of the of the uh, itself the uh, vaccines and doses because the actually the response from from the uh, IFIs from the international donor organizations for, to to the developing countries was really huge and we received really unprecedented uh, assistance uh, from all, all all the donor organizations. Thank you. And did you want to make a comment on the early lessons learned? And I mean, this is related oh. to, which is, you know, do we have a template as to how we can handle the next outbreak? So the 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 the, the lessons we learned from from the uh, this pandemic period is that uh, we should uh, keep going to to the, to the reforms uh, we earlier perform and we should even accelerate this reform. So uh, nowadays, the uh, Georgia, uh, like in uh, most of the developing country, facing several problems in, in the economy. So the uh, uh, debt to GDP increased. So the fiscal deficit I I increased historically. So it means that within the next uh, three, four years period, so we, we, we should uh, keep on the uh, having the macro stability in the short, short, short term of, of the period. So it's, it's very important that uh, we, we, like uh, many countries, developing countries could uh, keep going to, to, to their reforms agenda. And, Georgia is also the committee to continue and uh, even accelerate the uh, reforms we, we are performing. It's a fiscal reform to to um, to keep the fiscal parameters 
in line with, with, with our legal regulation. So to generate more revenues uh, for, for the uh, for, for the economy, also it's it's very important that uh, uh, we keep going uh, reforms in state-owned enterprises, we, which is also very big contributor to to the economy and to move the, these uh, directions to 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 the much more uh, market-oriented uh, perspective uh, to achieve the sustainable development in the short run. Sure. Thank you. I mean, you make this very important point that uh, you know there's a big problem because you need to expand fiscal expenditure whilst at the same time tax revenue has been declining because of reduced activity and so on. So it's a big challenge. Um, we're running out of time and I just want to ask you all now to keep your answers quite short if I come to you. Anybody else want to pick up briefly on this point about early lessons learned from the pandemic and how we can go forward? Anybody want to pick up on this? Okay, briefly if you would, uh, the governor for India, yeah. Zainab, if you would allow me, there should be a greater focus on health resilience for the Asia Pacific region and for which ADB as a multilateral institution of premier level in this region should apply its mind and see how best uh, we can have a framework for that. All right, which great. Which of course includes assets for health infrastructure. Sure, thank you. Very good point there that you've made. Thank you. Let me put this question to as many of you who would like to answer it as possible, just very briefly, because it's one that you've all touched on, in particular, the governor for, um, for, for Georgia. How can innovations such as digital technology be leveraged to help the post-pandemic recovery and enhance economic and social resilience? Who wants to kick off on that one? Don't all shout at once. Um, let me go. Um, who would like to? Kitty van der Hayden, would you like to talk about the role of digital technology? We know it's important in all sorts of ways because the pandemic has, of course, accelerated the digitalization of economies. And we know that about half of global trade in services depends on access to cross border data flows, technologies that connect firms and consumers through digital platforms, internet services, communications, and all the rest of it. So maybe um, touch on that question for us. Thank you. <laughs> you can have a look at Zainab. <laughs> Brilliant. In just a minute. No, look, I think, I think uh, digitalization is going to be absolutely crucial. This will be, I think, the skill that we need to grow out of this crisis. It is really part of any smart recovery strategy whether it is trade, whether it's health related, whether it's education related, whether it's job related. So this is something that will permeate through any recovery program um, and particularly trying to make sure that poor people do not fall further behind. Because if we do invest in a digital economy, which we must, and a digital trade system, then the first ones who will be left behind are the poor people. And so for them to accelerate, to achieve a life in dignity, I insist that we focus a lot on bringing poor people up to uh, up to the mark when it comes to digital skilling and one another point which is not around digitalization but where again i feel poor people will bear the brunt if we don't pick this up that is as part of the recovery program really focusing on an environmentally sustainable uh, pa development pathway really looking at what we do with fossil fuels really making sure that the energy review that the adp is now undertaking prioritizes a sustainable growth model, because if we have to retrofit like, you know, the developed economies are doing now, it will be much more costly and you will lose the opportunity to have a big economic price of green jobs and green growth. We have scientific evidence that going the green way is simply an economically rational way. Right? So I just wanted to point that out as well. Thanks. In the climate very, very quickly now. Uh, shall I go to you, Ms. Zoe? Um, we know that all these um, connections are going to increase. So the role of innovation and technology in, in, in this uh, the, the debate that we're having, we've touched on the digital divide and concerns there from Kitty van der Hayden, but your answer to that question. Well, uh, regarding the digital divide, I think we need to be sensitive to the uh, unique nature of this uh, digital divide. And the digital gap would take place not only between the, uh, the rich and the poor, but also between uh, different age groups. 
So uh, in my country, you can, ob uh, you, you, you can observe that a lot of uh, elderly feel difficulties to use the cell phone to take advantage of the uh, internet and to do the business online or the uh, purchase online and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, I think the government really need to uh, uh, put in place some policies to, to, to make the digital uh, technology to be uh, people friendly and help the, uh, uh, help the uh, low, income, uh, uh, low income people uh, to especially uh, the children to get appropriate education, to get exposure to the cutting edge of the new economy. Uh, and also give guidance to those uh, uh, companies to make their products uh, uh, users friendly uh, to, to all. Uh, and also uh, apply some disciplines to those uh, big tax uh, and to, uh, to, to um, uh, discipline them to protect the privacy of the people because a lot of uh, data is online. So um, there are a lot of things that the government should do and also for the multilateral development institutions like the uh, ADB. Uh, I think the MDBs should go beyond the traditional concept of the infrastructure. They really need to go ahead and finance the uh, advanced uh, non-traditional infrastructure, including the digital infrastructure as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for making that very important point about the need for consumer and data protection. Okay, so we've only got about eight minutes or so now until we end this session. So I want to come to all of you with just a final thought. You know, we are here di discussing cooperation for a resilient future for the Asia Pacific region. So on how regional cooperation and integration, how important is it? What role can it play, do you think, to foster a recovery that is green, resilient and inclusive? Just your takeaway thoughts. And I'll go first to uh, uh, Lasha Khud Sishvili, who is the current chair of the Board of Governors. Please, just a minute from all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So the, the, the first of all, what, what is the main most important that we, uh, we should identify all, all the barriers we have in uh, international cooperations and eliminate them. So the, this is very, very important that the uh, international cooperation, cooperation between the countries we wish we could uh, we could eliminate all, all the potential barriers we, which we have to, to boost the economic cooperation be, between the countries. So this will be the most challenging part of, of the post-pandemic period to, to, to have a much more uh, resilient and much more uh, uh, productive cooperation uh, between the countries, so which will give the, uh, our uh, nations more more jobs and more uh, more uh, access to, to to the better lives. Thank you so much indeed. Dismantling barriers, removing uh, these challenges and jobs. Thank you so much indeed, Minister Taro Asso. Your final thoughts on regional cooperation and integration. Well, I really appreciate the uh, today's uh, let's say productive discussion to overcome the pandemic and achieve the resilient and the sustainable growth. Well, I very much look forward to seeing you again in person in the next years without this corner valley, you know, directly, you know. Uh, and you're being together with President Vasa, well, of course, re-elected at the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I always look forward to you in <laughs> <laughs> so, so Nirmala Sidharaman, Minister and the Governor for India, brief final comments, final thought. Thank you very much. Um, uh, if you are actually aiming at a resilient and sustainable growth, particularly coming out of the pandemic, I think regional cooperation would have to focus on multilateral institutions working towards building digital assets, creation of digital assets, making sure that the assets that we build are disaster resilient, and above all, giving education and health digitization a priority. 
Thank you so much indeed. And now we go to Carlos Dominguez in the Philippines. Thank you. Um, EDB is the prime uh, vehicle for regional cooperation in Asia. Without ADB, we would not have been able to react as fast as we have uh, to the pandemic. ADB provided us the financing, the technical knowledge, even the procurement for the vaccines. And we commend them for, uh, for this. And working together with ADB is really uh, the prime example of uh, regional cooperation in uh, this area. I'm also happy that in our particular case, ADB worked very closely with the World Bank and the Asian, Investment, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to respond to our financial needs during this crisis. That is something that I brought up uh, when we had a meeting in 2017 and 2018. And I'm so happy that uh, ADB has taken the lead in that. So not only regional cooperation, but uh, worldwide cooperation in response to the pandemic, uh, to our benefit. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much indeed. The alternate governor for the People's Republic of China, Ms. Zhou Jiai, brief final comment from you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, uh, uh, thank you. I think uh, the joint efforts and the multilateral actions would be the key to uh, address the current challenges. Uh, I still want to take the uh, vaccine supply as an example uh, uh, to show how this is going to work. Uh, of course, uh, primarily as a fundamental uh, action, uh, each of those uh, vaccine produced countries need to try their effort to to enhance their production capacity. And then the uh, multilateral institutions like ADB and AIIB, they should take advantage of their uh, private financing instrument to support the uh, producing countries to uh, expand their uh, uh, production capacity uh, and also help to build up production capacity in developing countries. And yeah. thirdly, probably uh, the multilateral develop, uh, development banks should work together with WHO to accelerate the uh, assessment and ratification uh, of the uh, uh, EUS a little bit more to uh, make more vaccines available for emergency use. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. And just a minute, Kitty van der Hayden, thank you. I'm going to try and do it within a minute. Uh, less than a minute. Um, look, I think what we have learned, uh, an early lesson is that in, in a situation of crisis, um, unless you have regional cooperation, it's every country for itself. That is something you simply cannot afford when you're confronted with global public bads like a pandemic, like climate change. The ADB is the primary vehicle in the Asia and the Pacific to achieve collaboration, uh, to, to be a platform. Um, and just wanted to add that when it comes to cooperation, it's not just about trade and economics, it's digital infrastructure, energy infrastructure, climate and standard setting in so many domains. So the ADB is absolutely crucial to address all these challenges. Thank you so much indeed. And just a minute, 90 seconds remaining to you, President Massa, your okay. centre stage, your bank is centre stage. Thanks, uh, Zainab. Okay, uh, three things briefly. One is, as a uh, Georgia minister rightly mentioned, uh, you know, we are under huge, huge, you know, uh, pressure uh, on uh, public debt. Uh, and sooner or later, uh, to be sure, the US uh, will start to normalize its monetary policy. So definitely, uh, fiscal resilience need to be uh, restored and enhanced uh, jointly. And secondly, uh, the digitalization. Uh, Jai uh, said almost everything necessary. Uh, so in, in, in addition to address the digital divide, I simply would like to add that we also need to address the privacy issue and cybersecurity issue. And thirdly and finally, I am of a view that everything would agree uh, with the statement that we need to enhance our global cooperation to fight against this pandemic, which is also of such a global nature. And also 
I'm of a view that once this crisis is over, uh, globalization will return, globalization will come back. Then uh, what we should do is to enhance our regional cooperation effort in financial uh, cooperation area, in uh, regional health security area, and also in a regional supply chain area uh, to make the global system robust. So assumption here is globalization and the regionalism should not compete with each other, but complement each other. So if that's the case, uh, our enhanced regional cooperation, especially in our region, would surely contribute to the rapid, rapid and robust recovery of our world economy. President Massa, thank you very much indeed. And ending on that rallying cry for cooperation and complementary action, I declare the end of this uh, governor's seminar. Thank you all so much indeed for sharing your thoughts and insights with us. We've been discussing cooperation for a resilient future, lots of tools at our disposal. It's been my pleasure and privilege to have been moderating this seminar. I wish you all the best with your future discussions at this um, annual governors uh, at the annual meeting of the Asian Development Bank. For me, Zainab Badawi, it's goodbye to you all and thank you for all your questions too. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab, and goodbye, colleagues.